spoil. Our nation <laughs> is in chaos. The socialists are in control. They have wanted us to be more like Europe. Germany is calling for the United States and Europe to work together to save democracy. And yet, it is Europe that will become the beast and will be ruled by an emperor, a king, with ten kings who also will be beasts. It would seem that the handwriting is on the wall for those who can understand it. As these things begin to go downhill and start getting bad for us, what are we to do? When we think about the way that our nation was formed and the things that have happened, we think about all the wars, that we've been through as a nation. It seems that the normal response when push comes to shove is to fight. But is that what Jesus expects us to do? Now sure you have a right to self-defense uh, for now to some extent. <coughs> some criminal breaking into your house yeah, the government comes knocking on your door? No. Whether it is our government or a foreign enemy government, we need to realize what time it is when it happens. Does Jesus expect us to fight? John chapter 18. John 18 and verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Who was Jesus talking to? He was talking to Pilate, the Roman governor. The Jews were under Roman occupation, Roman authority. It was Rome that killed Christ. The Jews just insisted and yelled crucify him until they got what they wanted. But Jesus said, this isn't my time or place. But when it is, when he returns, then we will be with him and then we will fight. Jesus is the son of David. So he could have been born at the time of Solomon when Israel was free and prosperous and a ruling empire. But part of the plan was for Christ to be born and live at a time when he would be subject to a foreign power. He is our example. So how did he live? How did he act? He obeyed the law. God's law and the Roman law, such as paying taxes. We need to do the same as he did, even in captivity. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he was able even to subdue all things to himself. Our kingdom is not from here, just as Christ said. This isn't my time, my place. 
That isn't ours either. Our citizenship is in heaven. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Verse 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. As citizens of heaven and of the kingdom, what then does God tell us? We go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26 and verse 52. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? And for us also, in the day. He says, put up your sword. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13 and verse 10. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. When the beast is after us and making war with us, he says to have patience and faith. We are to trust God, have faith in him. Faith without works is dead. The normal response is to fight for survival, but not then. Wait on God. That's work. That's work. Trying to convince yourself not to do anything but to obey God and to trust God that he will work it out. Not taking things into your own hands but trusting God and his will be done. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Jesus suffered and we may also. If Paul says over in Romans 8, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Verse 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Jesus understands 
what we're going through and what we will go through because he went through it. You know, in a similar way, those of us who have had the virus can understand to some degree what others are going through. The fear that some have and the steps that they are taking to stay safe. It's like the old saying, you really don't know what it's like until you've been through it. And it affects everyone differently depending on their other health concerns. We know that from us. Is we all had a little bit different response to it. And uh, Chris had the worst. Ten weeks in the hospital and four cardiac arrests, uh, pneumonia, uh, you know, lost 50 pounds, uh, 82. But now he's home in rehab, recovering, and doing good. So the paranoia, the fear of the unknown is what they're really playing on. But we can relate because we've been through it. So we can understand. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38. You have heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. You know, that's hard enough to do today. What about in the future? <clears throat> what about uh, if you're, in, uh, you're being chased, you're, you're in captivity, you're, you know, you're a slave? Uh, uh, like I said, the normal response is to fight. But Jesus says, you know, turn your other cheek. Now, someone would, would say, well... It's just a slap. But the example he's giving here is he slapped you hard enough to knock your tooth out. <laughs> and what are you supposed to do? Turn the other cheek. Now that's both literally and figuratively. And we had that happen about 25 years ago. We had a guy in the church who was trying to uh, in his way to try and improve things. And uh, he went about it the wrong way and he got chewed out up one side and down the other. And I told him afterwards, I says, uh, well, you just got slapped in the face. I said, what you need to do now is come back next week and let him slap your other side. And he said, I can't do that. And he was a longtime member in the church. He said, I can't do that. Well, this is basic. The Sermon on the Mount is basic. We have to do what he says. That's the kind of faith and trust we have to do, that we have to have in God, to do what he says. It's not easy. But it's what we're supposed to do. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's not normal. But guess what? We're not supposed to be normal either. We're supposed to be better than that. That's hard to do. That's hard to do. Think about that the next time you're out in the car driving down the highway. <laughs> Bless you! <laughs> uh, that's what we're supposed to do. Just the opposite of what the normal response would be. Why? 
that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. In other words, we're all in this together. But you're not supposed to be like them. You're supposed to be better. Everybody's getting the rain. Everybody's getting the sunshine. Everybody's getting the air. But you're supposed to be better. If you want to be sons of your father. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be or become perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Not an easy task. <laughs> so he says, don't resist an evil person. Well, we go over to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 and verse 1. He says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you will have praise of the same. Well, God tells us not to resist the authority. Half of our country is upset, to say the least. Why? Well, we knew this was coming, but they didn't. They have no idea. Their God is government and politics. They have no idea what is coming. Is God in control or not? Did he somehow lose control? Is he no longer in charge? Of course, that's ridiculous. Everything that is happening, he is aware of. And nothing happens without his permission. Even the demons had to ask permission to stay in the country when Christ cast them out. They had to ask permission to stay where they were at and not be locked up in the bottomless pit in the abyss with all the others. Because that's what they were afraid of. Christ cast them out, they were going to be locked up with the rest. And they had to ask permission. So we know where all this is heading. So why get upset? Our citizenship is in heaven. And we are receiving a kingdom. All we have to do is be patient and wait. What did God uh, tell Paul and what did Paul tell us over in uh, 2 Timothy in chapter 3? And I believe Dan read that. Verse 13, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that's where we are. Evil men and impostors are growing worse and worse and deceiving. And of course, they themselves are deceived. They don't know it. They're wise in their own conceits. But that's where we're at. Deception is everywhere. You can't turn on a news broadcast without being lied to. Everything is twisted. Everything is, has a spin to it. Everything is uh, slanted. Parts left out so it reads one way instead of the way it's supposed to read. Uh, it's, you, you can't count on anything or anybody. And the ones that have control are the ones that are giving you all the information. And they're all on the socialist agenda. So deception and evil men are growing worse and worse. But, he says in the next verse, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom 
you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And it doesn't matter if your childhood was when you were five or six, or whether it's your childhood in the church, because we are all babes in Christ. And we all had to start learning somewhere. But he says you have to continue in these things that you learn. It's going to continue to get worse and worse. But we need to keep doing what God expects. The things that he has taught us, the things that we are sure are true. The things that we have proved. And if the world goes down the rabbit hole, all we can do is wave by. I'm not following you. I'm following God. Go your own way. Because that's all you want to do anyway. But we often wonder how many of the prophecies in the Bible that have happened in the past may have a dual or end time fulfillment at least in some type. I'm going to go back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 21 and verse 1. Okay, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent to him Pasture the son of Melchiah and Zephaniah, the priest, saying, Please inquire of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, makes war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful works, that the king may go away from us. Then Jeremiah said to them, Thus you shall say to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands, with which you fight against the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans, who besiege you outside the walls, and I will assemble them in the midst of this city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger and fury and great wrath. I will strike the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They shall die of a great pestilence. And afterwards, says the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, his servants and the people and such as are left in this city from the pestilence and the sword and the famine into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life. And he shall strike them with the edge of the sword. He shall not spare them, nor have pity, nor mercy. That happened to Jerusalem. As the enemy army closed in and all the people fled into the city to be safe, God was angry. They would not listen. They would not obey. Instead, they chose to do whatever they wanted. It's no different today. People won't listen. They won't obey. God is angry. What we have to look forward to right now is Obama on steroids. All those policies that were bad for the country and bad for the world are going to just get worse. But God gives a way out. Verse 8. He says, Now you shall say to this people, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he who goes out and defects to the Chaldeans who besieges you, he shall live, and his life shall be as a prize to him. Surrender and win the prize. That's what he says. Isn't that what we all did? 
the, like the song says, I surrender all. That's what we did. We surrendered all. And what are we going to get? Eternal life and the family of God and inherit a kingdom. But, he says, For I have set my face against this city for adversity and not for good, says the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of the Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. Stay, fight, and die, or surrender. Jeremiah 24. And verse 5. He says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Judah, whom I have sent out of this place for their own good into the land of the Chaldeans. For I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. <clears throat> then I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. For they shall return to me with their whole heart. He says, I sent them out for their own good. And I will keep my eyes on them for good. We already know God. We are already known by God. We are his people. We are his children. His eyes are on us always. In fact, he told us, Lo, I am with you always, even till the end. We're not alone. We're not on our own, as long as we obey. <clears throat> Jeremiah 38. And verse 2. Thus says the Lord, he who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he who goes over to the Chaldeans shall live. His life shall be as a prize to him, and he shall live. Thus says the Lord, This city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Therefore the princes said to the king, Please let this man be put to death. For thus he weakens the hands of the men of war who remain in this city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man does not seek the welfare of the people, but their harm. Don't listen to Jeremiah. Kill him. Get rid of him. We don't like what he's saying. You don't like what someone's telling you? Well, just get rid of them. Find some way to get rid of them. That's what they did. Of course, they ended up putting them in prison. Uh, verse 17. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If you surely surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then your soul, your soul shall live. This city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. Simple. What do you tell them? Surrender. But if you do not surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then this city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans that shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from their hand. Not only did it affect him, it was going to affect everybody else in the city. Surrender. Don't fight. God is merciful. Chapter 39 and verse 6. Then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. 
The king of Babylon also killed all the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with bronze fetters to carry him off to Babylon. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive to Babylon the remnant of the people who remained in the city and those who defected to him with the rest of the people who remained. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah the poor people who had nothing and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. The poor people got to stay in the land of Judah and were provided for. I wonder sometimes when we talk about the end time and we talk about the United States being destroyed and we talk about going into captivity, when you think logically that the United States is the breadbasket of the world and we know there's going to be a time of famine, if you were uh, going to take over a country, wouldn't you just take over the cities? Leave the land to produce the food that you know you're going to need and put the poor people to work? That's what happened back then in history. The poor people, they, didn't, they weren't fighting. All they had was rakes and hoes and you know, shovels. But the uh, the poor people, not only did they get to stay in the land, but he gave them all the fields and all the vineyards. Chapter 40, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had left him go from Ramah when he had taken him bound in chains among all who were carried away captive from Jerusalem and Judah, who were carried away captive to Babylon. And the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said to him, The Lord your God has pronounced this doom on this place. Now here's a foreign guy in charge of the army. And the way this is written, he's using God's name. And he's telling Jeremiah, your God, Yahweh, is the one who pronounced doom on this place. It wasn't our fault. God said he was going to fight against the place himself. Now the Lord has brought it and has done it just as he said, because you people have sinned against the Lord and not obeyed his voice, therefore this thing has come upon you. Now that's pretty bad when the foreign government that's taking you over tells you why. Because you wouldn't listen to your God who told you what you was doing wrong and told you what you needed to do to fix it, and you wouldn't listen, and you wouldn't obey. So you got what you deserved from your own God. It wasn't his God. It was their God. It was Israel's God. It wasn't the Babylonian God. So he says, now look, I free you this day from the chains that were on your hands. If it seems good to you to come with me to Babylon, come and I will look after you but if it seems wrong for you to come with me to Babylon remain here see all the land is before you whatever it seems good and convenient for you to go go there so he freed Jeremiah took the chains off of him he says you want to come back with me to Babylon he says I'll take care of you I'll look after you you don't have a thing to worry about you want to stay here? He says, you go wherever you want. Free free travel. You go wherever you want, do whatever you want. Then he gets a free pass. You know, get out of jail card free, you know. But 
it, you know, I, that's, he was the guy in charge. Now, while Jeremiah had not yet gone back, uh, Nebuzaradan said, go back to, uh, well, I won't bother with that. But he, uh, it shows that God can show favor on you and that God can influence the enemy to show you favor. When the head of the foreign army comes in and you've been let off in chains, he comes over and takes the chains off you. This is it. You want to come back with me? I'll take care of you. There's nothing to worry about. If you don't, yeah, you go wherever you want. You're free to go. Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 1 says, Now it came to pass in the thir 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kibar, that is, uh, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of Chaldeans by the river Kibar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. Where was Ezekiel? In captivity, in a foreign land, still doing God's work. God says, here, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to write. This is what I want you to say. And of course, he did. Daniel, chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and, when, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And verse 6, Now from among those of the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Where were they? In captivity. God sent them away for their good. Because remember, when Nebuchadnezzar came in, what did he do? He killed the sons of Zedekiah and all the nobles. So God had sent them away for their good. Chapter 2 and verse 48. And you know the story of the, the dream and the interpretation of the dream. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also Daniel petitioned the king and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. God showed them favor in captivity to their enemies. God can protect you wherever you are, however he wants. But in the end time, we will be sought out. We will be pursued. Daniel chapter 7, verse 21. He says, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Verse 24 says, And the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. 
You shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints will be given into his hand for a times, times, and half a time. The beast will persecute the saints, wear out the saints, make war against the saints. We go over to Revelation 13, and we'll read something very similar. Revelation 13 and verse 7, And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Overcome. Back in Revelation chapter 6, we read in verse 9, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Some will be killed. But it won't be much of a war unless God fights for us because he told us not to fight in that day. And yet, before God brings about his wrath, he shows us in the next chapter that we will be protected. So many of God's people will survive the beast. Chapter 7 and verse 3, he says, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So obviously some of God's people make it because we've already been sealed and there are more to follow. So we, we look at this and we, we wonder if we're going to make it, how difficult it's going to be. But none of us have been through what Paul has, and we never will. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm just going to read a couple of verses here as Paul was reminding the Corinthians what, he's been, what he was through. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Do you remember the time he was stoned and left for dead? And they dug him out. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And he says, besides these other things, what comes upon me daily in my deep concern for all the churches. Verse 32, in Damascus, the governor under the king was guarding the city with a garrison desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through the window in the wall and escaped from his hands. Determined to do the job. At the very worst, the very worst, we may go through a small part of that. After all, he went through that for years and years and years, and tribulation is only going to be two and a half years for us, you know, the, the great tribulation <clears throat> for the day of the Lord. We're protected from the day of the Lord. So, 
first three and a half years is just the beginning of it all. So we can look at what Paul went through and say he had a lot worse. Had it a lot worse. Uh, first, Thess uh, Second Thessalonians. A couple more scriptures here. Second Thessalonians, chapter one. Second Thessalonians, chapter one. As Paul relates to the Thessalonians, reminds them and all of us what they went through. Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalon Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, and it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not obey do not know God and of those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ the Thessalonians had persecutions and tribulation which they endured with patience and faith that God will reward As he says in Corinthians, it's a through much tribulation we must enter to the kingdom of God. So nobody's getting a, a free ride. Everybody's going to have some kind of problem, some kind of trouble down through history. Philippians chapter 4. And verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Let, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. So, you know, when it gets to be that day, he's telling us, Be gentle. Rejoice. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus you know on that day <laughs> if, if someone is leading you away in captivity and someone is uh, trying to you know persecute you <clears throat> punish you and, and you got this silly smile on your face and they can't figure out what are you smiling about any minute now I'm going to be in the kingdom <laughs> and you have no clue <laughs> finally brethren whatever things are true whatever things are noble whatever things are just whatever things are pure whatever things are lovely whatever things are of good report if there is any virtue if there is anything praiseworthy meditate on these things don't let the socialist agenda upset you Meditate on God and on his truth now and in the future. 
And remember to be like Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the stake and death. Because he knew the next instant he was going to be king. He's going to be back in the kingdom. He's going to be reunited with the Father. He wasn't going to let anything sway him. He wasn't going to let anything ruin the plan. He knew what was next. Then it was pure joy. We have joy unspeakable coming soon.